So Luke has asked me to give a presentation on, on Earth system modeling. Um, obviously that encompasses a, a huge amount. So really it's, it, it's, a, it's an introduction, um, some of which you, you may already be familiar with and some of it may be quite, quite new. Um, so in terms of what I'm going to present, um, next slide please. Um, I thought I'd give an overview of what we mean by the Earth system. Um, maybe a little, a little bit of motivation of why we develop Earth system models and how we use Earth system science uh, in understanding uh, climate and climate change. Um, and, and that then will lead on um, to, uh, I'll show a little bit about uh, the evolution of models um, from the beginning of, of climate modeling right through to, to the present day uh, and the kind of developments and complexity that we've added um, over over time, and then I'll um, I'll focus a little bit on on the UK's current capability in terms of Earth system model, um, and then show some recent uh, science highlights. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, next slide. So when we refer to the Earth system, um, we're really talking about um, there's four spheres, uh, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, the geosphere and the biosphere. And of course, within each of those spheres, there are complex physical, chemical and, and biological processes occurring within each sphere. And of course, those processes interact across spheres as, as well. Uh, so it's very much a, a coupled system um, it encompasses the natural cycles of various elements, uh, such as carbon, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and so on. And of course, it includes a, a water cycle. Um, and of course, uh, life itself is, is a really important aspect of, of the Earth system. And that's represented here in the figure, um, uh, in particular, um, the ocean and, and terrestrial biosphere. Um, but of course, humans have a huge impact on, on the Earth system as well. And one could argue that it's us and our activities that are, are driving uh, significant changes uh, within the Earth system uh, at unprecedented uh, timescales. Um, OK, um, so next slide, please. Um, and you can move on by, by two. So over the next few slides, I'm going to talk about how we use um, Earth system science. And in some sense, it's something that motivation that drives the development of, of our models. Um, um, so one example of, of why um, of how Earth system science uh, is used is is in in action, in, in quantifying how human activity impacts on, on the Earth system. And we measure that through a, a metric called climate forcing. And this particular figure is showing how changes in the atmospheric uh, concentration of ozone has impacted on the Earth's radiation balance um, over the historical period. So if you ignore the three lower lines on this plot, uh, you can see that over the historical period, uh, changes in ozone have been driving a, a positive change to the Earth's radiation balance. And by that, I mean um, we're getting a net uh, increase in the energy input into the Earth system um, over time. Um, and at the present day, that's about 0.4 watts per, per square metre. Um, so if you think of uh, the size of a football pitch, um, that's equivalent to a, a kind of three bar electric fire or a powerful uh, microwave running all day, every day over the area of a football pitch. And of course, if you imagine the whole globe, there's lots of football pitches can fit on the area um, of the earth. And so that's a lot, a lot of extra energy being input to, to the earth system. And that's only because of changes in, in ozone alone. Um, without considering other changes. So if we move on to the next slide, we can then see um, how that change in radiative um, balance has, has changed over the historical period, but now looking at a whole suite of emitted species, which are listed there on, on the left-hand side. Um, and you can see how those emitted species uh, are impacting on, on the radiative balance. And the contribution that ozone is making is, is shown in, in the green. So ozone itself isn't emitted directly, 
um, but is changed in the atmosphere from, from the emitted species listed on, on the left. Um, so um, you can see the, uh, the bars to the right have a positive radiative to forcing and CO2 is, is the major driver of, of positive climate forcing. Um, but you can see towards the bottom of that, that the aerosols um, are offsetting some of that, that warming. Um, and of course, it's only through having models with interactive chemistry and aerosols uh, and including a radiation scheme that we're, in, we're allowed or are able to, to quantify these uh, impacts from human activity on, on the Earth's radiation balance. Uh, next slide, please. I think there might be, yeah, and you can move through again. Thank you, Luke. Um, the other motivation behind uh, the inclusion of Earth system complexity within climate models is, is the carbon cycle. And I know that this isn't directly relevant uh, to your interest, maybe in atmospheric composition, but nevertheless, the kind of feedbacks relevant here to the carbon cycle are also at play in terms of atmospheric composition. So the figure on the left is, is really showing uh, the sources and sinks of, of carbon dioxide. Um, so uh, fossil fuel use uh, and cement production are the main uh, sources of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere with a more minor source from, from land use change. And then on the bottom of that left hand figure, you can see where that emitted CO2 um, ends up. So about 50% of it remains in the atmosphere, and that's what we refer to as the airborne fraction. And then of the remaining 50% uh, is taken up by both the land and, and the ocean. Um, so on the, on the right hand side then, you can see the various fluxes of carbon um, through, through the Earth system. Um, some of these fluxes are quite large, um, measured in gigatons of carbon per year. Um, and relative to some of the terms, um, the emitted emissions is quite a small term, about nine gigatons of carbon per year. But because of the airborne fraction, um, about four gigatons per, of carbon per year remain in, in the atmosphere. And, and that's the airborne fraction again. And of course, um, the... Uh, those fluxes of carbon, uh, those sources and sinks are sensitive to both climate change and to CO2 levels. And of course, uh, depending on those sensitivities, uh, that airborne fraction may, may change. And of course, that's incredibly important then in determining how much of emitted CO2 remains in the atmosphere and indeed uh, the impact both on climate forcing and on, on climate response. So actually understanding and quantifying those feedbacks is incredibly important. And the next slide, please, Luke, um, shows uh, a quantification of these carbon cycle feedbacks, um, both from the land and, and the ocean. Um, so the top two there are referring to the, the carbon response to CO2. And what you can see there is that as we increase carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the amount that's taken up by the land and the ocean increases. So that reduces the amount remaining in the atmosphere. And so that's referred to as a negative feedback. Uh, and in contrast to that, um, on the bottom then, you, we're seeing the, the response to climate. So as the climate warms, the ability of the ocean and the land to take up carbon is, is reduced. And that's increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere or the airborne fraction and hence is positive uh, feedback. So of course, it's the balance of those two that, that's important. And you can see there are huge uncertainties, particularly in the land terms. Um, and so it's incredibly important that we understand uh, those terms and be able to narrow that range of uncertainty so that we can understand how the airborne fraction itself will, will change in the future. Um, next slide. <clears throat> Another motivation behind uh, in, including earth system processes in, in climate models is actually to provide policy advice. And this particular example is, is on mitigation. Um, this is a figure taken from the Global Methane Assessment that was published in 2021 by the United Nations. On the left-hand side here, we're seeing, uh, you're seeing a bar 
representing the magnitude of anthropogenic methane emissions from the year 2020. Uh, and the second bar is then showing potential reductions um, in methane emissions that are technically feasible uh, given current technologies and given current understanding of, of methane emissions. Um, and so potentially we could reduce methane emissions by 2030 by, by something like 30% um, if we were to implement some of those uh, feasible technologies. And on the right hand side of this figure, it's, it's showing then the potential benefits from that uh, mitigation action. So, for example, you can see we could avoid 0.3 degrees of warming by mid-century if we were to implement all of the methane mitigation measures that are feasible uh, through methane, methane's impact on air quality. We can um, avoid... Um, uh, we can reduce uh, mortality, we can reduce the number of visits to A&E with, with conditions such as asthma, and of course we can also avoid uh, crop damage through uh, ozone's impact on, on vegetation. So this example here is, is on mitigation, which is about emissions reductions, but likewise models with interactive chemistry and aerosols can also be used to look at uh, more con controversial, if you like, or more unconventional climate interventions or, or geoengineering uh, methods. And again, these approaches are um, designed to um, counteract anthropogenic climate change. Um, and with sufficient complexity and representation of our system processes, we can then quantify both uh, the benefits and the potential trade-offs um, of these interventions, which is incredibly important in terms of providing um, policy advice. Uh, next slide. So, and, and next slide again, thanks Luke. Um, so hopefully um, those examples have, have, have given you an indication of some of the motivation behind uh, the inclusion of earth system processes in, in climate models. And this particular figure is kind of trying to illustrate the evolution of climate models um, over the past half a century or, or, or more. So initially in the 60s, the first climate models um, developed were really either atmosphere only models or, or ocean only models. Um, and then as, as the decades progressed, they started to be coupled together and started to include sea ice. And you can see that it was really in the 1990s or so that atmospheric composition um, came into climate modelling. And this is really because of how aerosols are offsetting uh, greenhouse gas warming. Um, and really in the 90s, it was probably only sulphate aerosol uh, itself that was, that was modelled. Uh, and since then, of course, the complexity with which we model atmospheric composition and the range of Earth system processes that we, we are now representing has, has increased. So we're including carbon cycles, uh, dynamic vegetation, ocean biogeochemistry, and increasingly atmospheric chemistry and, and ice sheets. Next slide. So in some sense, that slide there is very simplistic because it, although it shows you the expansion of, of the representation of Earth system processes, it isn't really telling you about the level of detail or complexity with which we're, we're representing those processes. And this is what Stride um, is represented in this next figure. Um, so here the cylinders, if you like, and the different colors are representing the, the different Earth system components. But the height of each cylinder here now is represent is 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 trying to represent the complexity of each component. So if you like, in terms of, of aerosol, uh, initially, it would have been just sulfate aerosol that would have been represented. Uh, there would have been assumptions about size distribution. Um, uh, and so the, uh, the representation would only have been modeling the, the mass of, of, of sulfate and the interactions with radiation and cloud would have been quite simple. And of course, over time, we've extended uh, the species of aerosol that we represent. We no longer make assumptions about the size distribution. So we're modeling both mass and number and the interactions with both radiation and, and clouds have also um, improved over time. And you can see atmospheric chemistry starts to come into play here at, at, at the bottom right. Uh, next slide. 
So in addition to climate models having um, an evolution over time, um, it's also true that composition models themselves have had a, have a hierarchy. And this is what's represented here in this fairly busy slide. So on the bottom left, um, we have a zero dimensional model called a box model, which you've been using this week as part of your, your training. Um, and that's fixed in space, um, but allows you model processes and, and integrate those processes in, in time. Um, so that might be photolysis, it might be chemistry, it might be aerosol microphysics or, or deposition. Um, and it's actually a, a brilliant framework for, for testing these processes, um, understanding some sensitivities. Um, of course, the next step up from that zero dimensional model is, is a 1D model. So this again is a box, um, but this time uh, we're allowing the box to move in, in space and, and time. Um, and of course, it can then pick up uh, conditions as it moves um, in, in in the three-dimensional atmospheric space uh, by, by picking up different winds or different temperatures or it may be at different altitudes. Um, and then, then the next step up from that is a, is a chemical transport model. So this could be a two-dimensional model as, as, it would, as they would have been initially, um, but, but more likely to be three-dimensional now. And this is where you provide a model with um, offline meteorological fields, including temperatures, pressures, winds, and so on. And you're driving um, an atmospheric dynamic model, which in turn then um, is moving your tracers around. And then of course, you're, it enables you to do chemical transformations as well on, on your various constituents. Um, and that can be referred to as a, an offline model um, because there's no feedback from the, the chemistry back to, to the meteorology. Um, so what your chemical processes are, are doing have no, have no bearing on, on the dynamics. And that is also true of the next um, um, model there, number four, the chemistry uh, general circulation model. Um, again, this is an offline model in the sense that the chemistry isn't impacting on the dynamics. Um, but um, the, the dynamics here are interactive and the model is generating its, its own weather. So in moving from uh, the chemistry GCM to a chemistry climate model uh, number five, what you're doing there is that you're closing that loop between chemistry and radiation, or indeed aerosols and, and clouds or, or aerosol and radiation. So then changes in atmospheric composition are uh, impacting on, on the dynamics um, of the model. And of course, the next step up from that is, is an Earth system model that might include a carbon cycle, uh, ocean biogeochemistry, and, and so on. And indeed, the interactions between composition and, and those other Earth system components as, as well. OK, um, next slide, please, Luke. So, of course, we may only be interested in a particular Earth system um, component um, or a particular process, but we, we need to bear in mind um, that if, if our component is, is within the Earth system, then, of course, it means we're very susceptible to, to underlying biases in, in the model. And I illustrate this here with ocean biogeochemistry. Uh, so, for example, the figures on the left are showing uh, the strong seasonal cycle in biological activity. Um, and in this case, I'm plotting um, surface um, chlorophyll concentrations. And of course, um, the ability of a, an ocean biogeochemistry to, to model this seasonal cycle, um, given the sensitivities of biological activity to the different drivers, will depend on the, on the ability of the model to get the dynamics right, to get the nutrient availability right in the model, get the variability right, um, and so you're very much um, dependent on, on those underlying physics and, and dynamics in the model. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see that actually not only are we seeing uh, variability on a seasonal timescale, there's also sub-seasonal timescale. And so again, our ability to, to model uh, that variability will depend on the, on the underlying model's ability to, to capture the variability in the drivers. Uh, that we're sensitive to. 
So moving on to the next slide, we can see an, um, an example of this um, in atmospheric composition. Uh, this is an example from work from Joao Texera, who's doing a PhD, in which he's coupled an interactive fire emissions model called Inferno um, with UKCA. And, and here he's looking at a comparison of uh, burned area fraction uh, from GFED, which is quite a standard uh, database that we use for both burned area and fire emissions. And that's shown on the left. And on the right, he's showing um, the diagnosed burned area from the UK's Earth System model with uh, the fire model. And you can see, for example, uh, in Southern Africa, uh, we're underestimating um, the, the fraction of burned area. Um, and actually, Joao in, in that paper discovers that that bias in burned areas is largely driven by the underlying vegetation, which uh, is determined by the, the vegetation scheme. So it's not an observed vegetation distribution, but it's, it's a modeled one. So in that area um, of Southern Africa, we're overestimating the, the tree fraction and, and underestimating the amount of savanna grasses. Um, and that then leads to an underestimate in, in the fire size uh, and hence in, in fire emissions as well. So that's an example of, um, of where uh, the underlying vegetation is, is, is giving rise to, to biases in burned area. And of course, that will feed through to, to biases in, in emissions and, and composition as, as well. And of course, in integrating a, an earth system process, it's not only um, it's not only important to understand um, those drivers and, and those biases and how they might impact on your own component, but it's equally important to understand how implementing a new component will impact on, on the rest of the model as well. And because the whole system is so fully integrated, um, actually, it ends up being quite complex. And so I would say, process-based evaluation of physical climate models is, is much more advanced than, than in the case of Earth system models. And it's partly because of some of the complexity um, in the interactions. Uh, next slide, please, Luke. Uh, and you can move on again. Thank you. Um, so I um, I said I would cover some um, detail on the current UK's Earth system model capability. Um, and this schematic is, is showing uh, the different component models that are included in, in version one of the UK's Earth System model, UK ESM 1.0. So the, the boxes here shown in blue, or the portions of boxes shown here in blue, um, represent what might be included in, in a physical model. So in the case of UKCA, it includes the aerosol, and, and, and that's, that's included in a physical model. Um, so that the aerosols can offset um, any greenhouse gas warming. Um, and you'll see that in the UK Earth System model, um, the physical climate model would be made up of, of the atmosphere, the land surface model jewels, uh, the aerosol component of UKCA, and then the ocean model NEMO, uh, along with the sea ice model um, sea ice. So of course we can, um, uh, next slide, please. And there's a, um, yeah, so for example, we could run a, an atmosphere only physical model, um, and that's uh, documented in a paper by David Walters. So it encompasses the unified model atmosphere from the Met Office, coupled to the Jules land surface model um, with UKCA aerosol included. Um, we can also run the, run the physical climate model um, coupled, um, by coupled here I mean uh, coupled atmosphere ocean, um, and if Luke moves on then you can see the red box here now is what we might uh, call a, a coupled physical climate model, um, and that's described in a paper in, in James by Keith Williams et al. Um, and then if you flick on again Luke, um, the aerosol component of both the physical models uh, and the earth system model are described in this paper by Jane Mulcahy, published in 2020. Uh, and the chemistry in the right-hand box 
Um, and if you move on, Luke is described in a paper published by Alex Archibald. And Alex would have spoken to you on um, Wednesday, I think it was, about the chemistry um, in, within UKCA. Uh, next slide. And so the Earth system model here is encompassing all of those components in that red box. Um, and it's described in a paper by Alistair Seller that was published in James in, in 2019. You'll see on the left that bicycles, which is an, an eye sheet model, wasn't included in, in UK ESM 1.0. Um, but it is um, the coupling of bicycles with the rest of the Earth system model is, is ongoing and, and it will be included in, in future releases of, of the model. Uh, next slide, please, Luke. So UK ESM 1.0 um, was frozen in about 2019 um, and was used extensively in, in what we refer to as CMIP 6, that's phase six of the coupled model into comparison project. And that project um, um, produced quite a lot of new results, new model simulations, new analysis, which then fed into the intergovernmental panels on climate changes um, assessment report, uh, which was published in 2021, uh, the IPCC's uh, sixth assessment report. Um, however, um, in UK ESM 1.0, and indeed it happened with, with other Earth system models, um, um, if we examined the, the, the temperature record over the historical period as a, as a global mean relative to the pre-industrial period, um, a number of models that contributed to CMIP-6 had what was referred to as a, as a pothole. And you can see UK ESM 1.0 here on the left in, in blue, showing that it's anomalously cold relative to the observational record shown in, in both green and, and black. Um, so in a paper uh, documented by Jane Mulcahy last year, um, UK, um, they revisited uh, the aerosol and the aerosol budgets and the aerosol forcing in UK ESM 1.0. Um, they improved the SO2 dry, dry deposition. They fixed various bug fixes and did some retunings. And in particular, some of those changes resulted in, in a reduction in the magnitude of the negative aerosol forcing. And so looking at that uh, same temperature record again, um, the updated model in, in red here, which they named 1.1, uh, is shown in red. And you can see that that pothole or the depth of that pothole has, has been reduced relative to the observational record. And the figure on the right uh, is showing the, the northern hemisphere, mid, mid and high latitudes, where, of course, the bulk of the aerosol um, is emitted into the atmosphere. Um, because of the land surface area uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. And again, you can see that the temperature anomaly in that region was even greater than was seen in, in the global mean on, on the left. So in addition to having a, a UK ESM 1.0, there's also a science configuration called 1.1 available um, in which the aerosol forcing has been improved. Next slide, please, Luke. So, of course, it doesn't stop. The developments don't stop uh, with 1.1. Um, um, development is already ongoing um, to um, progress uh, the complexity of components, um, but also to include new components, for example, like the eye sheet. Um, uh, and so uh, Jane Mulcahy is leading the development of, of this next Earth system model, which will be called UK ESM 2.0. Uh, no surprise there with the, with the name. Um, and the box on the left here is showing the various developments that are ongoing uh, and that um, are aimed to be included in, in that UK ESM version two. Um, you'll see there, there's a traffic light system um, that's really to kind of indicate the level of maturity or level of readiness of, of the different developments um, um, with green being more, more mature than those in orange, which in turn are more mature than, than those in red. So of course the risk uh, associated with including each of these in, increases as, as you go down the list. And of course, the, the aim here is to have version two ready and available uh, in time for the next phase of CMIP, 
Um, however, the next phase of CMIP may actually happen in, in two separate phases. They're proposing uh, an early phase called, called fast track um, with a later phase. Um, and if fast track goes ahead, it, uh, there's a risk that UK ESM 2.0 wouldn't be ready. And so um, it's possible that we will, we will freeze an interne intermediate model um, before the release of, of, of version two. And at the moment, the working name of this intermediate model is called EE UK ESM 1.1 ICE. So not a particularly... <laughs> Uh, not a particularly good choice of name. It doesn't roll off the tongue. But the two E's here indicate that it has CO2 emissions driven and it has methane emissions driven. Um, in UK ESM 1.0 and 1.1, uh, those greenhouse gases um, had co were, were concentration driven, meaning that we prescribed what the concentration in the atmosphere of those greenhouse gases were. Um, whereas now we will be driving the concentrations um, here with, with emissions uh, rather than, than concentrations. Um, okay, uh, next slide, please. So I think you'll, you'll acknowledge that Earth system model and the development of an Earth system model has become increasingly complex because of the range of Earth system components and indeed the complexity within each of these components. And so, you know, it does involve some, some decision making uh, along the way, um, particularly if someone is developing something, um, you, you know, in developing an earth system model, one has to decide, are we going to include it? So this kind of flow chart on the right kind of gives you an indication of the kind of steps that would be taken in deciding, do I include this development or, or not? And of course, one key question is, is it important in the context of climate change? Is it policy relevant? Um, you know, what are the scientific drivers for in, including that development? Um, and then you can go on from there. You know, do we have the relevant expertise? How, how well mature is the development? How does it perform? Um, what is the impact on, on the rest of the Earth system? Uh, in terms of scientific performance, but also in terms of computational costs. So these are always the kind of questions we need to ask and, and answer in, in developing these, these earth system models, um, particularly as they become increasingly uh, complex and expensive to run. Uh, next slide, please, Luke. Okay, uh, and you can move on again. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to finish up with just a couple of slides showing some recent uh, highlights. Um, so earlier I showed um, some figures um, talking about carbon cycle uh, feedbacks. So this is a figure um, from a paper published by Thornhill et al. And this was the first multi-model assessment of different non-CO2 biogeochemical feedbacks. Um, so again, it's, it's quantifying how climate change might impact on, on composition uh, related processes and how that, that ch climate driven change in processes might feed back on, on climate itself. So, for example, just to take one example there, say the wetlands uh, uh, methane, um, that's the positive bar. Um, what we're saying there is that as the climate warms, uh, wetland emissions of methane uh, will increase and that increase will, in, will exert an additional 0.15 watts per square meter per degree of temperature rise in, in global mean temperature. So that's what we might refer to as, as a positive feedback. And of course, if wetland emissions increase as the climate warms um, at that rate, it means in terms of methane mitigation, we actually have to do more to realize some of the, the climate and air quality benefits that I, I pointed out previously. Um, and of course, that's just one feedback. Um, and again, um, it's a balance of how these um, integrate uh, together. And you'll see in some cases, like in um, biogenic volatile organic compounds, you can see that models don't even agree on the, on the sign of the feedback. Um, so still incredibly important to do some more work there um, on understanding some of, some of those feedbacks. Uh, next slide. Um, 
So this next example is from Stephen Turnock, um, who works at the Met Office, but is, is based at Leeds. Uh, and in particular, he's assessed a range of future pathways and quantified both the climate and air quality impacts um, from these different pathways. So the two plots um, are quadrant diagrams. So if I focus on the one on the left, um, the horizontal line here uh, represents a, a zero climate forcing. Um, so any of the points um, above that line um, have a positive radiative forcing and will, and, and will give rise to a warming. Anything to, below that line uh, will give rise to a cooling. And likewise, um, the vertical line here is, sh is showing a, a zero change um, in the MDA8 ozone metric that is, is, an, is, is an air quality human health uh, type metric. So anything to the right means a degradation in air quality and anything to the left is, is an improvement. And so we've ranked these different pathways um, based um, on this climate forcing um, ozone metric um, framework and it allows us then identify which pathways give rise to both the climate benefit and an air quality benefit which would sit in this, this left uh, lowermost quadrant um, and which of the pathways give rise um, to a, a, a lose-lose um, would sit in, in the right uppermost quadrant. Um, and of course from a policy perspective um, you know, um, government agencies like DESNES are really interested in understanding both benefits and, and trade-offs of, of climate action. Um, and really what we're seeing here is that if we, um, if we reduce um, aerosols um, from air quality policies, if we can coincide those aerosol reductions with strong methane mitigation, we can still get a net climate and a net air quality benefit overall. Um, and Stephen went on to quantify health impacts from these different pathways, um, and both of those papers are, are linked there. Um, next slide, and I think, yeah, and you can move on. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to finish up there. Um, I hope I've given you a feel of, of what we mean by the Earth system. Um, I gave you some examples of, of some of the motivation behind uh, studying Earth system science, particularly in the context of contemporary climate change. Um, and of course, that motivation then drives the development of, of climate models. And you'll have seen the evolution uh, from very simple climate modeling back in the 1960s uh, to the kind of much more complex uh, Earth system models that we, we develop and run today. Um, and then I gave you a brief overview of, of the different UK Earth system models, um, both those that are frozen, but also plans for our, our next Earth system model. And then I finished up with some recent uh, science highlights. Um, so thank you very much um, for inviting me to talk, Luke. <coughs> Excuse me. And thank you very much um, uh, for listening. And I'm more than happy to, to take some, uh, some questions. Thanks, Fiona. That's great. Um, are there any questions uh, for Fiona? So um, while people are gathering their thoughts, I, I, um, I was wondering, you know, are there any, you, you've talked a lot about the different you know, the ongoing development and, and processes that are being added in and that sort of thing. Do you think there's any kind of gaping holes that we haven't, that we could do with putting in that haven't been yet? Um, well, that's a good question. <clears throat> I mean, I guess there'll be always, <clears throat> excuse me, there'll always be gaping holes. I think in terms of UK ESM 1.0, um, ice sheets was a was a was a huge uh, hole, particularly because um, any changes to ice sheets will really give rise to irreversible change. And we already know from IPCC, for example, that sea level change um, is likely to be irreversible. And of course, um, um, ice sheets are an incredibly important component of of that. Um, so. 
UK ESM2 and indeed um, this intermediate version will really be a huge step forward. Um, I guess the other question, um, the other gap is probably in nitrogen, I would say. So the coupling of nitrogen, for example, between um, the atmosphere, the land and the ocean is, is poor. And, and indeed, nitrogen uh, in the ocean is considered a closed cycle. So it doesn't even take any nitrogen input from, from rivers or from the atmosphere. And of course, nitrogen is, is incredibly important as a nutrient determining the uptake of carbon um, um, by the ocean from the atmosphere. And so again, there's a, there's a real key gap there, I would say, in terms of, of nitrogen. Um, one could always argue, um, um, you know, that, that chemistry and, and aerosols themselves are, are lacking in terms of complexity and representation. We see that in, in terms of the, the extent of this VOC speciation that we, that we aim to represent. Um, but there's always compromises to be made as well, because, of course, that, as we add in more complexity, we also add in more cost. And, of course, cost also means um, more carbon in terms of um, energy use, uh, storage use as well. Um, so there are compromises to be made. Um, I guess a key, a key question is, you know, um, what are the important gaps? Why are they relevant? Um, and if there's a strong scientific driver, then, you know, that then, um, um, you know, kind of forges the way for, and, and, and is it acts as a strong argument for in, including those processes. Um, but of course, there's also going to be unknown unknowns as, as well. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, as time, as time evolves, we realize there, were, there are more and more gaps that we, we haven't even considered. And do you think from a policy perspective that would guide what gaps might be filled first, for instance? Is there something, you know, perhaps nitrogen from, say, a food perspective or something like that might be interesting to put in before, you know, that might dictate the order things are done or is it just a kind of everything is done as it can be? Um, I mean, I, d I guess to some extent... Often policymakers will use it to the site, you know, will also divert, you know, will ask that question of scientists, um, because really it's the scientists themselves that are often have um, the more, you know, the deeper expertise uh, and and understand the, the knowledge gaps. Um, so in some sense, it's it's a bit more of a of a two way discussion, I, I think. Um, I guess another question is whether. You know, um, I suppose there's horses for courses as well, um, you know, and an earth system model, you know, perhaps can't address all scientific questions. But then it's a question of, well, can an earth system model provide drivers for another modeling framework to address more specific questions, say, around, around food, for example, um, because crops, for example, would be fairly poor, poorly or crudely represented currently in, in, in earth system models. Yeah, interesting. Um, any other questions from anyone else? Uh, hi, Fiona. I had a quite a simple question. I think. Um, thanks for a really nice talk. That was really interesting. Um, Thank you. So sorry, sorry if you said this and I missed it. Um, I was also away from the course on Wednesday when you had the diagram of all the different types of models, and you were talking about. Uh, I think you called them closed models, whereas like a one way. Oh yeah. Mm. system when we use the ukca within the um is that is that a closed system i'm not sure if i've like so luke if you can go back to that so actually with ukca in the unified model we can run it in in actually a few different uh, ways so for example um say so essentially um ukca within the unified model um, could be run as a chemistry climate model um, it, or it could be run within the Earth system model where there's a carbon cycle. So if we take number five there as a chemistry climate model, um, I call this an online model because, um, because there's feedback from the chemistry back to the radiation, and that's what the figure is showing. But likewise, there's feedbacks from the aerosol onto clouds and onto radiation as well. And of course, we have the option of breaking that 
those loops, in which case it can then become a, a chemistry a general circulation model. But we also have the option within the unified model of kind of running it a bit like a CTM. So we can, and in fact, Mohit, who has been um, helping out with the training this week, uh, is responsible for what we refer to as nudging code. And this is where we still run the unified model, um, but we're, we're reading in uh, reanalysis and we're using those reanalysis to drive the dynamics of the chemistry. Um, so we can kind of run it in, in a number of different modes. Does that answer your question? Oh, yeah, that does. That's really interesting. Thank you. And of course, we use that nudged capability if we're interested in comparing with, you know, flight track data or satellite observations where the weather uh, really matters um, for the observation. Um, whereas if we're running, you know, if we're comparing with the climatology, then, um, you know, running in, in, you know, modes four, five and six um, um, are, are suitable for that kind of evaluation. <laughs> Ian, thanks very much. You're welcome. Thanks, Al. Thanks for any other questions. Uh, do shout out because I'm showing my screen, so it's difficult to see uh, hands. But do if you've got a question, do shout out. Uh, I had a question. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Alex. Um, there was a slide comparing GFED to UKSM1 and Inferno. It's a, a bit specific, so no worries if you don't know. But I think um, Australia, there was like a big gap between. I just was wondering if that's a similar point about how the vegetation's like misrepresented in that region or if there's a different reason why there's a discrepancy there. Um, I can't recall actually whether Joao explored that. Um, it could be both a combination of, of the underlying vegetation, but we also have difficulty with rainfall in, in that region. So it, it also could be um, driven by meteorology as, as well. Um, um, and in fact, I suspect it's more to do with the meteorology because um, dust emissions, for example, from Australia in the model can tend to be too too strong, and that's related to um, the bare soil fraction. Um, um, yeah, so um, it could be a number of, of factors, but I think it's possibly driven more by by the meteorology than, than the vegetation. But of course, the, any dry bias would also impact on, on the vegetation that the model would, would simulate as, as well. And is the GFED stuff, is that an observational data set or, sorry, you may have mentioned that. Um, it is, uh, it uses um, satellite observations um, to, cool. to derive burned, burned area and then uses emission factors to, to convert um, uh, that burned area along with information on vegetation to derive uh, emission rates. Um, so we typically, when we're prescribing fire emissions, would, would typically use them from the GFED database. Um, of course, now we're, we're moving to having those emissions more, more interactive um, with Inferno. Yeah. 